Thank so you, Evelyn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so it's such a pleasure to be with both of you and, and to say that it, throughout our conference that we've had, we've seen you as models of a mutual learning and we've learned so much from you. So it's wonderful to have you speak to the rest of the community. Oh, well, it's actually our honor and privilege to be with you. Mm. Um, just to set a context of why we are sitting here, Carmen and I, how we've been brought together in all of this. Um, I think it goes back a number of years. I work in the field of conflict resolution. I have been one of the pioneers in that field in Australia. And um, one of the areas that I work in is in the family area. And I was dealing with a dispute, must be now five, six, seven years ago now, and um, I could see that the struggle that one of the parties was having in being confronted with something that, that um, the other partner had done, that they could not get past. It didn't matter how many years and what um, perhaps reparations or trying or aiming to, to get over it, to, um, to somehow experience a, um, a shift in their relationship from this pain or resentment, they just couldn't do it. And this aspect is something that I saw again and again in these family situations. And I suppose because it's a family situation, the need for there to be free-flowing love is you know, it's more obvious when it's not present. So um, one day when this was happening, uh, one of the parties looked at me and said to me, well, what would you do if this happened to you? And normally I would throw that back and, you know, well, it's not really what I would do, but how have you dealt with things like this? I might answer, ask another question. But in this case, I saw the struggle of this person and I wanted to honour him with his question. And so I really thought hard about it. And I looked and I said, I think I would forgive. That's how I would deal with this. And he looked at me and he said, what? I can't forgive. So I went away from that and I thought to myself, conflict resolution was something that wasn't part of my childhood. That's something that came in only in the 80s and 90s, really, as a term, as a, as a way of dealing with conflict, at least in the Western culture. And um, I know from being part of this field that it has made a complete difference to the culture, at least the society in Australia, within Australia. Conflict resolution now um, offers people uh, a process, a skill set, a way of talking, thinking, a way of moving from being in a really difficult, unpleasant fighting situation to moving out of it in a way that is dignified, in a way that, that they understand that there's a role for this and then you can move out of it and how to get there. So after this experience I had, I thought to myself, I wonder if there's a similar learning training for forgiveness. I went on the internet, I googled, and I came across the work by Fred Luskin, who's a wonderful, wonderful man. But, and I got in touch with him and that was great. And another person I got in touch with was the forgiveness, Hawaiian Forgiveness Project in Hawaii. And that is a gem, a pearl in the ocean, that is. And I got in touch with the people there. Um, it's Michael North and Roger Epstein. And we had um, a bit of dialogue going there over the internet. And eventually um, I came, I went across there in 2009 for their Hawaiian Forgiveness Day. And I was part of the, the celebration there. And what they do is um, something that I invite you to, to Google and rather than use this time to discuss their work. But what they do do is they honour the heroes and the heroines of forgiveness. Mm. And um, while I was there, the first person who came to introduce, to give a welcome, because we're in the Hawaiian context there, um, in the university, was Kawila Clark. Kahuna Kawila Clark. And he stood up and he blew the, um, the conch shell 
And what I heard, this was in September, and I'm Jewish and I practice my, my, uh, my faith, my practices from a tradu Jewish traditional way. And when he blew that conch shell in September, I'm sitting there and thinking, but this is the way that the Jewish people, this is the way that we acknowledge um, our Forgiveness Day, which is Yom Kippur. We blow the shofar. And I'm sitting there and, you know, he's blowing it with the same intensity, the same commitment and dedication and, and inspiration. And, and how I understand um, the chauffeur is that it is a calling to the soul. It is a harking. It is a, a time to remind people to, to um, it calls the soul out. And the way that Ka Ka Kahuna Kawila Clark was doing it was he had, um, I think, two of his sons and another gentleman there, and they also responded. And this interaction that, that um, began the ceremony was something that I just felt so akin to that after the, um, when there was a break, I went up to, to Kawila and we had a, a short conversation and he invited me then to come to the Comprehensive Healing Centre in Waianae. And um, in the course of our conversations and um, later um, internet connections and whatever, I was, um, I was then inspired to bring to um, really the world's attention the ongoing um, commitment that some cultures and people have had on our planet at the present time to continue these beautiful and um, inspirational ways of dealing with life's difficulties that are not just brought from um, academic knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there is another kind of knowledge that is within our grasp within our reality of being human beings, being created amongst the rest of creation. And that this knowledge is, is, um, is not something that sits at the same level as academic knowledge. And I also work in academia and I write and publish um, articles. So I wanted to be a part of the widening of this voice. Um, I've started an organisation in, in Sydney called the Holistic Practices Beyond Borders and our aim is to work with professional people to increase the understanding of what holistic means. It's not something that just means bringing together all the bits of something. It actually includes this sacredness that exists, that there is something holy in being a professional. A professional isn't someone who is a um, who is a businessman who's there to earn a living a professional traditionally up until not so long ago probably um, a, a generation ago was someone who had a sacred role to fulfill within the community to support people in 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 either getting better in healing in either finding justice in being able to pass on knowledge to the next generation. It had this very much, um, this role of leadership in the world. Not It wasn't a business um, aspect of earning money. It was about leadership in society. And I felt that there, were these, there, there are knowledges that are still part of our world, that there are bearers of this knowledge that aren't given a voice, where their knowledge is not recognised on the same par as, um, as academic institutions. Hence, this is the work that I've been, that I've been um, working with, with the support of others who feel the same way. Um, there are many people on, uh, on our, on, in our world at the moment who, who feel the same way, and I'd have to say, just for a moment, that I want to um, acknowledge people like Pauline Tesla, who has started the Collaborative Law Movement, one of the founders of the Collaborative Law Movement. And, um, these people are coming from, from um, the legal context where lawyers who are suffering greatly from depression and dealing with, um, with
with drugs and things like this, as a result of their, the work they're doing and the drive, that there have been people within the law profession who recognise the need to create another way of practising justice and delivering that to the people. So there are other movements. Um, now, coming back to why we're sitting here, um, so uh, we wanted to, uh, as a group, our Holistic Practices Beyond Borders, Borders, we needed to be united. We needed to have the same um, frame of reference. I understood where I could see we needed to go, but to to share that with others, I could see was not was not the way forward. The way forward was to get somebody else in from the outside who was a bearer, who was an active bearer of these knowledges. Knowledges in this case was of forgiveness, of, of dealing with um, people that included something that was, that was um, a traditional knowledge and bring that into our group. And um, there was an opportunity for some conferences, some, some legal conferences, law conferences and peace conferences in Sydney and Melbourne at that time. And so I asked Kawila, um, would he like to come? And he said, no, I have someone who I think is perfect. Hence, calm, and he'd been sitting here very, very patiently. No, no, no. He, he recommended somebody else, but they couldn't make it either. Ah, oh, no. He gave me two names, and I contacted you two both at the same time. Yeah. But that's right. The other fellow was, you know, he was more. He, he quickly answered back, but no. Uh, uh, and calm, and um, as an active bearer, yes, I'd like to um, ask you, if I may, what, what. Um, made you respond to my invitation with such genuine um, commitment? Well, I'm sure that the question you asked me, it, it was around um, the things that were working for us as, as Indigenous people. What was the thing that was shifting us um, from presenting um, in all of the stats, the low stats that show us as gold medalists, as Indigenous people, as gold medalists at everything bad. Poor health, poor housing, poor education, unemployment. And that's what it started from. So that's what got us to engage. And so the answer to that, we believe, was to look at um, you know, a colonisation process, but that's only one part of it. You know, because we we talked about incarceration, so um, I'll put it to you like this: in Aotearoa, New Zealand, eighty percent of the crime is committed by twenty percent of the population. Twenty percent being my people, because we're a minority in this country. So when you look at that, that paints a pretty grim picture of what my people are like. These stats will, will show you we're disproportionately represented right across the board. So we needed to have a look at when our people were incarcerated or suffering from poor health or whatever, all of the mechanisms brought in by the predominant culture, which is Western social science, um, wasn't fixing our problems. And that's acknowledged right throughout the world, even through this conference, mm -hmm. from the brother speaking from the Amazon, mm -hmm. and he highlighted that. So they were looking at, like what's called, um, in, in Aotearoa they looked at health reform, mm -hmm. and um, they were looking at the Ottawa Charter, which was about um, communities reorientating mainstream about best practice models for your mm -hmm. communities. So it all came out of that. It came out of documents that were written years ago by our learned people that are indigenous here. See, because uh, in Aotearoa, our, our, our people have actually led out in restoring our language, uh, bringing back our principles and values, mm -hmm. and striving to implement them. Like we mentioned that yesterday, and on Māori TV last night, because we have our own TV station, uh, we're able to educate our people straight from the womb about our principles and values now. 
uh, and through all schooling right up to master's degree in our language. So we've led out and Hawaiians have come here, Mohawk Indians have come here, who all are after the same thing for their people, to, to help reduce um, recidivism, mm -hmm. people continuing to fall back into the system. Because all the models that have been brought to us come from that Western social science background, psychology, sociology, but none of them come from our background. They're coming from out of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. from Europe, and that's the reality that we're faced with as Indigenous people. So then you still have a, a people that have a monopoly and, and that actually becomes an industry for the predominant culture. Now that's what got us going, yeah. sister. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so then we, I started sharing some of the stats, because eh? we don't write the stats. Mm -hmm. We know the problem. Because mm -hmm. uh, as far as everything shows, we are the problem. Mm. But all of our learned ones said uh, they've got a saying here in Aotearoa to fix things for Māori, okay, they have to be by Māori because that's any indigenous people will have their own in, in the indigeneity where they will have their own principles and values that they need to aspire to, not to have some forced on you or a way of getting you to them. So we use that step from the beginning, and you know this is this is real because sometimes when you say it, people think, "Man, that can't be that bad," but it's actually real. So we have currently uh, we're twenty we make up twenty percent of this country's population, like most indigenous people, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, over here, we have five thousand, roughly five thousand inmates that are Maori in this country. So we feature as about sixty percent. We think it's higher than that. Same as in Hawaii, because that's where I met Kawila working in the prisons over there, taking our cultural best practice models over there. But I just wanted to highlight this is, this is why we talked, because um, to incarcerate one Māori inmate costs taxpayers here roughly $86,000 to $120,000 a year each one. Now you times that uh, by 5000 and you're looking at, I'm not a mathematician, but you're looking at millions of dollars. You're looking at five, six hundred million dollars a year per annum. So a business is made off the backs of, of the things where we're failing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, just in the last year, because uh, we have two Māori parties, Māori are represented uh, through most of the, through every political group there is in this country, Māori have a high representation, which is different to most of the indigenous people as well. But that's because we assimilated um, English culture a lot better than a lot of indigenous people. And um, I just wanted to say that with that, our Māori ministers of one of those parties, the Māori Party, Dr. Peter Sharples, um, He's the Associate Minister of Corrections here now. He's the one that announced last night on TV, I was telling Michelle here, that now they've put it into law that our principles and values will be taught to our children in school as part of the curriculum for the first time. Um. Now these are the, the breakthroughs that we're having, but it's not coming from our sole voice alone. It's coming from our First Nations brothers in Canada, mm. throughout the United States. And, and through the Pacific, because we're all saying the same thing. Our tangi, our cry is the same. And, and so that's, that's good news for us. But um, the minister who leads the Māori Party is a woman called Tariana Turia. And Tariana holds the portfolio for youth um, in the government as a minister of youth. Mm -hmm. So she pushed back to Māori principles and values around the family unit giving the power not to government, but to the family, back to the family to take care of the family programs. So they initiated a program called Fano Ora, which means that Ora is well-being. It actually means eternal life. That's why we say Kia Ora means to eternal well-being. That's how we greet each other. It's also the word we use for I agree when you're speaking. I'll say Kia Ora to agree with you, because I'm wishing you to eternal life. I'll also use it for thank you 
It's the same word. Holistic, eh? Mm -hmm. So when you look at it like that, $600 million a year, it costs corrections to, to provide security because they, their whole core business is around protecting public safety. Mm -hmm. Okay? But, but then what they gave Māori back to help fix the problem up was $76 million. That's to fix the whole problems that it causes. They pushed for this whānau development, for us to start to push and fix the problem, to focus um, on uh, causation and intervention rather than the treatment. Because the punitive approach around incarcerating people mm -hmm. is, is you're a bit too late, eh? With the education, but you're never too late as far as we're concerned. You see what I mean? So to help fix the problem, our people get given $76 million and it's spread out to all the tribes. So all the rest of the country is jumping up and down. That's too much money to give these natives to fix their problems. Mm -hmm. But a system here that's corrections gets $600 million per annum mm -hmm. and they think that they're fixing us. Whereas we have all the stats too and that's the good thing with the system here is they keep their stats. Mm -hmm. And their stats will clearly show you that the punitive approach and all of their methodology for dealing with it from Western social science models mm -hmm. reduces incarceration by 23%. So, so can, can, can I ask you, what... Um, we, we met a few years ago when you came to Australia and um, there was a paper that was written on holistic law. So we, we, we put together the, uh, the indigenous framework. framework, that's right, and the ways of, um, of understanding perhaps um, pono, which is a sense of, yeah. yes, and, and balancing and energy balancing and all these, mm -hmm. these intrinsic parts of indigenous thinking. Critical. Critical, and bringing that into a... Um, a framework that is within Western understanding. I mean, that's really what we've done together. Is that yeah. is that with the conflict resolution um, paradigm, there is an opening for us to look at conflict as something that is part of life, mm -hmm. and looking at how to move towards another part of life, which is which is resolution, fullness, yeah. wholeness. And so we've 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 worked together on this. And I'm wondering for you. What has been the journey for you? Yeah, well, what drives me is a sense of responsibility to what was taught to me from my elders. And um, you heard me just before speaking to an elder who's one of many that's, that's taught us our, our traditional practice and their, um, their exemplars of, of what we should be doing. So. Um, you know, before I start to say, talk about the framework and what works for us, I just wanted to acknowledge, because we actually have to look at what the systems do. And I just mentioned one system, corrections, that these are big corporations, and currently we've got three of those corporations bidding for ownership of a jail in Auckland that will house 1,000 Māori inmates. Three of them. Now, I've been blessed to be brought in by a tribe, tribe uh, with, with a company from Australia that's bidding for a contract for that prison to provide that, that family well-being from our perspective to be, to be the foundation of how they're going to um, run that prison. So that's an honour to me because that will highlight where, what we believe will resolve conflict for our people only in that arena. But I wanted to just go back a little bit and, and look at what we're really doing is we're challenging core business. So policing, if you have a look at what policing is based on, from a Westerners' view, and most policemen don't know this, but it's, they, they operate from a paradigm that they call the Radcliffe Three I. So Radcliffe was the person that developed the strategy. The strategy is to gain information and intelligence to impact on the criminal environment. 
So translated to my people, that business survives off busting you. That's their core business, is to bust you, to find you doing something wrong and to bust you. The courts, justice, their, their business then, and that's what happens, eh? The families, but um, their... We better make this a short pause. Yeah, but their business... Ah, I think it's good. Yeah, but I still think it's good because that's what happens, is... The, the courts then, their core business is to try us and to judge us, okay? And then corrections core business is then to incarcerate us, you see? Mm -hmm. And that's their whole process mm -hmm. of resolving conflict that we're in. Mm -hmm. But it's a massive business made off the backs of our people. Because if you, you need to have a look at the history to see what put us in that negative stat bracket in the first place. Now that's what this conference has been about. We talk about the forefathers of the non-violence movement and the passive resistance 50 years before Gandhi brought that to the world and implemented it in India. And years later, Martin Luther King used it. Our people were practicing it here. And so that's why we needed to go back to it. See, they were, they, their, their lands were burnt, mm -hmm. their houses were burnt, and we were stripped of the principles and values and our leadership that actually gave us and made us sustainable as a people. Now that's what we've been through through this conference. We had students that have studied peace and mediation here that never knew the story that was told. Because this history is what needs to be told so that we can then see, because we have to be honest, and, and it's not to pass blame or guilt onto the predominant culture, but we need to know why these stats came yes. about. Indigenous people just didn't wake up one day and say, we're going to leave the stats in incarcerations, and we're going to leave the, 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 all the stats in negative health stats, sugar diabetes and all these, and in addictions. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So we have to look at that. And when you ask what drives me, that's what drives me because we're taught our history here. Not so that we'll dwell in conflict and, and, and pain and suffering, because our elders showed us the way through. So when we talk of Te Whiti or Romamai, the ones who were the publishers of peace, when their lands were being confiscated, our king, the Māori king, whose land was invaded in 1863, and they conf confiscated over a million acres, but they still forgave people for that. They said to stick hold fast to these principles of being honest mm -hmm. and true in what you're doing. But above all of that, you had to have what we call aroha puma. Aroha puma. Aroha means to be able to find yourself, to be able to stand in front of the Creator, in front of God unblemished or unspotted from the sins that other people put on you. Now, we believe that we brought that knowledge ancestrally from our original homeland, which we believe all people come from the same place. So we believe that all people, even our oppressors, know the knowledge and they can genealogy back to the knowledge that can actually heal us. You see? So that's where we look at the framework now. Because the framework is about identity. Because to us, dignity, this conference is called yes. Dignity and Humiliation. Yes. Dignity comes from knowing your identity. Mm. Because then you will see, to us, we will say these words, same as in Hawaii. The Hawaiian welcome, you go to the airport there, it will say, Aloha. See? So, Aloha there is saying, they say, they translate it, that is love or compassion. It means to find yourself, be kind and generous to find yourself always able to stay in the presence of God. See, because our language, we get given a translation, our language gets lost in translation. Because the English language can't do justice to what our language is saying. So they say, ano ai, that's aloha, ano ai, which means you know, welcome, they'll have welcome. That's not what it means. 
But it still does mean welcome. It means best wishes to you, bless you. It means all of those things because it's holistic. It says Amo Ai, which means the feast on the seed. The seed they're talking about is a seed of knowledge that was implanted in all mankind when we were in a spiritual realm before we came to the earth. And that's what they're saying, feast upon that seed. Because that is the seed that will never be lost or forgotten. E kore e naru, e kore e memeha. Because that's the important part to remember. That we believe that mankind isn't lost. But as long as we aren't spiritual, we're lost. Mm -hmm. We will never be forgotten, none of the races on the earth. Because Atua Iwa, our creator, placed us in all these different lands. He gave us all our different languages so that we could see through all, we call it smoke and mirrors. All these different things to do with language. Mm -hmm. eh? yeah. Whereas all of us will share the same principles that we love our children. We want the best yes. for our children. No race on the earth wants, wants to do bad things to their children. I don't believe that. So that's what we're focusing on. Genealogy is the most important thing that our framework is based on. We call it whakapapa. And that means action back to the earth because we believe that our first parents were created from the earth. You see? That's why it's so important to us to know your identity. And then what happens from there, the next part of the framework, is manatane, manawahine. And because of the Dignity Conference, I brought a proverb that is as, as it's ancient, but it says, pay heed to the dignity of woman. Because woman in our culture stands at the same level as God, because she's able to, to create within her, within her womb. Same as the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, we were created from the earth, and that same power is given to woman. So our proverb to do with the woman is, when we were in the womb, we were fed by the femur, which is the placenta the umbilical cord from the mother. When we're born, we place the placenta, we call the pito, Hawaiians call it the pico, we put that back into the land as a symbol that that's where we came from originally. And then from then on, the land feeds us. That's why we call it Mother Earth. She feeds us fruit, trees. Mm -hmm. Under the water is land. You see what I mean? So all of those things we are then fed by our mother. That's how important the woman is to us. People think we're a chauvinistic culture because they're stuck in the mindsets from their culture. Women are so elevated in our culture that men go before the woman, but that's to protect them. The role of the man is to preside over the woman and the children. There's a big difference between standing over and dominating mm -hmm. to presiding. Presiding is to take care of things to keep your house and everything there in order and your land. You see? Around protection, presiding, and providing. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about serious balance with nature. Because nature is the woman to us, Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. You see? Now that's why it says pay heed to the dignity of woman and the gift of procreation given to man. You see, the sacred gift of procreation, because that's what we're protecting here. Everything is being procreated. All trees, everything living, will procreate. Eh? From the flower, the flower's got to come from the tree, the tree's got to come from the root, the root's got to come from the seed. See, you see the metaphors that we use? Because mm -hmm. that's what you're protecting, is the sacred gift of procreation. Because that's the, 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 our environment to us is no different to us. Okay? And then from there, we look at, in our framework, we go from man's responsibilities and woman's responsibilities, our roles. Then we go straight into the framework about our principles and values that hold those laws. Because our people believe in law. Predominant culture here has told us that we believe in folklore, that our mm. stories are myths. We can give a long social discourse on what we believe, and they will say that's interesting. 
they'll even say that's an interesting myth. Hey? Whereas we we believe this. This is what kept us in balance with nature right until. And we made our mistakes with nature too, don't get me wrong. Because we're fallible, all of us. Every culture has done things that, that aren't conducive to well-being at some stage. You see? Mm -hmm. And then the next part of the framework was then um, we talk of a arapautama. We talk of a de defense mechanism that our people had and we experienced that today. Where we showed how to protect a village and a structure. But what, you know, we talked about palisades and lookout towers, but those were to protect us from evil. Because what we believe is that if people are striving to get your land, that's what our ancestors said when they were exiled from their lands and their lands, their crops were burnt, and they were brought down to here, right where we are, and incarcerated for 19 years by an imperial power from England. But our people still got through that because they forgave them. Because they believe that, you know, and it's and it's and it's it's evident in the song from Bob Marley. <laughs> Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. See, because we believe that we could be free even though we we're oppressed. Because mm -hmm. it was in our heart, in our mind and in our soul. You mentioned two of the aspects of the framework that from the programming that you're doing in See, so that's that's the um uh, what we call um, the part to Wata Wata was the defense mechanism, but it's only a metaphor to protect your land mm -hmm. within those palisades, your woman and your children, because then you're protect, protecting your generations to come. But what it, what it says is, those are all based on values and principles. And the principles are threefold, like the three feathers that Te Whiti O Rumamai and Toru Kaki the, the forefathers of non-violence action, they wore those feathers because they represented te tika. Tika is, is everything that's true. Pono also means the same thing, but it means to have faith in things that are true. Pono. You know the Hawaiians say, ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. It's the same thing. The land is perpetuated in righteousness because our people believe that the land and everything will be kept in balance as long as we are true and we have faith to those beliefs because they have God given rights to every man, every kindred, every tongue and every nation because that's how we were taught the language in English but we say it in our language, Nga Hoe Fa, people from the four directions. When it was asked to our ancestors what was the most important thing in the world, their reply was, it is people, it is people, it is people. It doesn't say it's Māori people. Mm -hmm. It's Anishinaabe from, from the First Nations of the Americas, from Turtle Island. It says it's all people, because we understand the genealogy to where we come from, because we acknowledge God. So truth and light, that's tika and pūnu. Truth is light, and light is truth, and they are what consist spirit to us. And anyone that's drawn to truth and light, anything good comes from God, comes from you, from the Creator. So truth and light consists of spirit. Okay? And that's the soul of man. To us, the soul of man is both spirit and your body together. Because if you don't think like that, you'll go after the desires and the wants of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's wars and contentions everywhere. You see? Mm -hmm. But we have to submit to the spirit. And so we, we believe that in that structure that I showed you today, the principles and values are what hold it solid. And that's how you know that the whole earth, and I said that in, in, in my oratory today in my language, mm -hmm. handed down from that elder, 87 years old, handed down from his father, from his father's father's father, all the way back. And, and it says that Mother Earth is grieved because of the sins that her sons commit on her. That's ancient. Pre-European, pre-Christian, pre-any other other religion that came here. Is that what that's that's what was acknowledged before. Because our ones that our leaders that that um, taught those principles of Tikka and Pono, 
truth and light, and the overriding factor was unconditional love. Te tika, te pono, me te aroha. Those are the three feathers, the raukura, the pare raukura, the tohu tawhiti and tohu kākahi, and te whiti oromuma, as people still wear in their hair. The toro, the albatross, because the albatross is given dominion over the sea, even though it's a land creature. Um, I think that for people listening, they, 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 they would be, and I wonder, I wonder for you as well, if, if you're thinking, um, how does this relate to the professional world? How does this knowledge and this language and these, mm. these um, ways of thinking, how on earth can you bring them in? Well, let me tell you how we have managed to do that. By working together and by the... Um, by other people who've also, there's someone called Edward Hall, Edward T. Hall, who was a psychologist, a social psychologist who was working in Japan in the 40s, just around after the Second World War. And um, he was also grappling with this, um, this cultural dissonance between the Americans who were living in Japan and the, the Japanese who, who were living in Japan and problems that were coming between them and um, it was because of his his insight and his his desire his his wanting to be able to find a way through it where these people could understand he was a psychologist so he was brought in there to help the americans to deal with the the cultural dissonance that they were having and um, it's through through um, People like him, there are many of them who, throughout the world who have noticed this, um, this, this um, perhaps um, area of, of um, wonderment around how human beings um, have, that all have some, some um, unity, there's something that, that makes us all the same, yet there's this, this diversity that exists. And then how, how, to, how to bring that in a place where there's harmony. And this is something that, um, that Carmen and I have been working on, and I think we've been quite, I think that's what you've noticed, why you, why you yes. brought us here together, that we've, we've found a way through this. And um, the, there's lots of papers that we've written in the book that, that's available also that sort of draws this into a much more, um, uh, if you like, a, an easy to read understanding. But I just want to leave you with an example of how the wisdom of the ages is related to the wisdom of now and brought into the professional world. Um, the um, I just want to give you an example of a mediation I did recently where I drew on all of the conversations that we have. And so in the beginning of the mediation, I announced that my, my values and my um, sense of loyalty lies with the dignity and respect of all the people who are sitting in the room. And so um, I had spoken to each one of them individually, but I felt that they all had the same, in my eyes, the same level of dignity and respect. And I can tell you that at that point I could see the, the fear or the sense of, you know, she's going to fit more with them and she's going to fit with me, she's not going to understand me, that that all disappeared. Now it's not the words that I used, it's the sincerity of those words. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that that's the aroha part. That's, that's the unconditional love part. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to say when you're talking about principles and values, um, and we've come to that together, is that there's a process that's been set. There's a footprint for us to follow. And, and most indigenous cultures have it. But what we believe is that all nations have it at one time. Yeah. But we've opted to not acknowledge the laws that were given to us and that attached to a law, there has to be mercy attached to it. That's what you're talking about. There has to be compassion. You have to have laws, otherwise people would kill and, and, and you have to have a punishment attached to it. 
so that people know that it's wrong to do those things. That's from the beginning of time. Our cultures teach that. But see, with law and how you implement it these days, there has to be mercy attached to the lawgivers. So we're leaving all decisions to politicians, to lawyers, to judges. If they don't have the principle of mercy in what they're doing, okay, well, well, that's why we're in the state room. But there's a process that has to be also there, which is the process, when you're punished, you need to be given a time. We call it te wha There's two periods of time. Te wha there, After you've been punished for doing something wrong, there needs to be a time, a probationary period, where you're able to deal with what you've done, to either pay back, mm -hmm. The, the hurt or shame that you've imposed on somebody, or you need time yourself to deal with you being shamed or violated. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's, and it's a probationary time, and it's a, pre a preparatory time for you to, to re-enter back into well-being. This is what happens in the system. There's no forgiveness mm -hmm. attached to the law and the punishment. And that's what we have to come to because all nations are going to say, we will go to this medium for mediation. We will go through this other medium to resolve it. But for most indigenous people, and I'll speak for, for my First Nations brothers, they usually, they usually do it by acknowledging the mediator, by, by burnt offerings. The burnt offerings creates the smoke to carry your prayers to God. You see? That's why they smudge. They do all of these things. All First Nations people do it. Mm -hmm. But when you look at our culture deeply, in our culture here in Aotearoa, we have something special. We believe that he set the example for us, so we actually didn't need burnt offerings anymore. That's what we believe. See, that's why he's at the back of our meeting house. When we come in from the front, mm -hmm. he's carved, the Creator's carved at the front, but we enter and we go right to the back wall, which is the Pautuaromo. And that's where we lay our dead when they die. Because through him we have eternal life. See, we have these principles and every culture will have something like that. But this is what we have. There has to be a mediator that has the power. See, because you have to have the pono, the faith, mm -hmm. to believe that that's what you have in place so that you can be forgiven. But now we're focusing on, we're focusing on one word, we're, we're focusing on it, we're calling it shame, or we're calling it something else. But there's a whole process that's been set in place for us so that we can resolve conflict. Mm -hmm. And that's why our people, indigenous people, come to it fast. When we had conflict today in the greeting, yes. we came to it quickly because it's part of us. It's intrinsic in us to forgive, mm -hmm. to, to show true compassion. And, and that's what we need to take into professionalism, mm -hmm. is for them to understand those processes so they will come to compassion straight away. And I'm, not, I'm saying, if, if you are truly ticker, true and honest, right from your heart, mm -hmm. you will be able to, to discern when you are in a place of judgment, you will be able to discern the outcome rather than just go according to a book and say, this is what you get for this crime. You see? And that's what it, what's happened to law and justice. It's become corrupted. You know, read read books like The Halls of the Court, and it'll explain judicial systems now. In this country, we sing our national anthem, which says, God of nations, at, at thy feet. Mm -hmm. Hear our voices, we entreat. Hey? Beautiful words. But this country, it will still bring in laws to dispossess us of our rights over the sea. That's what's happening right now. Foreshore and seabed. You're going to have, because there are issues over people fighting over resource, because they're not being honest. They're not being true to themselves. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing about identity for us, dignity and humiliation, is about looking at the three selves. Because we all have a self-perception of ourselves. True? Mm -hmm. No matter where we come from. 
But then what we need to look at is our real self. And then what we have to look at from there is our ideal self. Because that's what we believe in. We believe in transcendency to a higher plane. That we are literally sons and daughters of a living God. We believe that. All through our conferences, we're going to have people struggling because they don't want to hear the word God. They're uncomfortable with it. They want it to be called according to what their ancestors will call it. Allah, Buddha. We don't have a problem with anyone what they want to call God. My people don't have that problem because we acknowledge him. We have many names for him. But we have one name for the God of peace. And we call him Romo Matane Nuyarangi. And that means to listen to the sun that was held in high esteem in the heavens. We don't have a problem with it. And if all mankind could lay hold to the principles and values that were left by their forefathers and search them right to the very core, you will find that you will come back to the truth that all of us was left with. The truth, the faith that that truth came from, the belief in that truth, and how to demonstrate it in our practice, which is aroha, aloha. That's the greeting throughout the Pacific. We say aloha, or we will say haere mai, which means literally coming to me, right to me. Okay? Because you're asking them to enter into God. And, and that's the answer. To, to apply it in professionalism, clinicians, doctors, is, is the same principle that all of us was written into our hearts and our minds and our souls before we came here. That's why the brother from the Amazon said, to, he sang the song from the Amazon and said the translation was the memory that was stored in your skin. Because when you feel the spirit, the Hawaiians say chicken skin. You get it because that's your heart, mind and soul resonating to light. It's the same as when the sun hits you, you'll feel that on you. It's the power of God. So I'm just interested now, um, Linda and Evelyn, you've been sitting here listening to this. I'm just wondering what you've heard and how it fits with you. Well, you know, um, what I'm so grateful for both of you and throughout this conversation is being a living example of this dignifying dialogue. Together, you have added so much to our conference in not just what you're teaching us and what we're learning from you, but also for how you interact in such a deeply respectful, mutually supportive. Um, it's inspirational. You know, my background is moving, uh, as you're talking about psychology and social science, their focus is in historically always been on the individual person. And what I see now is we're moving in the direction of thinking more relationally, and you two have been sort of exemplifying how powerful that can be when you're working in harmony and not uh, draining your energy with uh, distractions or contentions or debates. There's just this incredible ongoing flow of compassion. And if either of you would love would speak about that, I mean, I think we have a lot to learn. Well, I think, um, I mean, Carmen can put your thoughts forward, but my thoughts are that we both have got the same aim. We both have a superordinate goal. And our superordinate goal, our goal that is up there, um, that we both are reaching towards, like you might find in a triangle where you've got the two sides and they both come together at the point. That superordinate goal, I think, we all resonate. And it's not just Carmen, Kawila, all the people that, that, um, that have joined the holistic practices mm -hmm. um, beyond borders. We all, and I think I, I, I'll ask you if you feel the same way, but this superordinate goal is to use our lives for the purpose that we were brought here. And that the only way we can connect into that is to be, as, as Carmen said, he used the word pono. I'm, I'm Jewish, I think I said that before. And I would use the words, um, one word that is part of my culture is, is a chassid, is a sadik. And what is a sadik? I mean, we aim for that. We aim for a more common word in Yiddish is called a mensch. What is a mensch? A mensch is someone who is a decent human being. 
and decency means not just in what you do or, or, um, or what you say, it is how you are. It is someone who has dignity and respect for any anything that's around them. And the reason why we we um, we can hold this dignity and respect, which is what you're witnessing, is because, and I think Carmen is on the same tell me if, I, if I'm not speaking for you, but we believe that there is a creator, that, there's the, that our creator created everything, not just the, the, the beautiful flowers and the trees and the ocean and the hills, but all the human beings, all the animals, that, they, that we were all created. And that in this creation, it's not something that happened and finished. It is ongoing. It is the creator sustains us all. Just as the sun goes down, we don't think, oh, I wonder if the sun will come up tomorrow. You know, it will come up tomorrow because it's, it's an ongoing in creation. And we hold this into our lives so that, so that, um, that when something happens, I mean, I came here to this conference with two very strong PowerPoint presentations that had videos and all sorts of stuff <laughs> in it that, you know, I'd worked very hard to put together with others so that it was... It was technically, you know, up to very, very um, state of the art. It didn't use any of it. And that's okay. That's okay because as I honestly believe that, that, um, that, that my life isn't just for my own purpose that I can think of and plan and goal, there is this superordinate aspect that I constantly, constantly aim to connect with and by aiming to connect with this by working on my constant just like just as I, I i have to make sure that if i you know that i eat or i drink or whatever i constantly make sure that i'm tuned in and when i'm tuned in that i'm able to to remember that being a mensch being a sadic i'm not a sadic but being a mensch or aiming towards that Aiming towards decency, dignity, respect is the sole is is the sole um, process for me to carry out whatever mission that I have been put here to carry out. And 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 yeah, you know, well, well for for um, for our people, it's um, opposition. We call it the Tahuaroa. It's there right until the day you leave this earth. Conflict will be there because it's been consecrated for our good. Mm -hmm. And and you know, we believe that in the beginning of time, as for children of the Creator, there was a plan set before, and the plan was that we be given a body to come to this earth, and our spirit would be housed in that body and the reason for that was because then we would have agency for ourselves to choose what we would do we would become like our creator we're given the gift the sacred gift of procreation as she said he's created everything living including us we have given been given the power to create and to destroy but we weren't put on the earth to destroy we were put on the earth to follow the example given to us and there was laws attached to that. But there was another one who stood in the plan. We call him Tumatoena. And he stood and he said, no, um, let me come to the earth and force everybody to do things one way. Now the firstborn of the Creator, this is our story, mm -hmm. the firstborn of the Creator said, I support you, the Father, that give them the right to choose for themselves, right from wrong. The other one said, no, 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 I'll force them all so that they will return to you. See, but our eldest brother, Tani, who helped in the creation, he said, no, no, let them choose for themselves to become as, as our Father, as a God. See, now that's some big, big talk deep talk for us but then what happens is if they make mistakes I will stand as the one as the example and the way for them to come back now you might have heard this story because of the religions that you come from this is a Maori story mm. 
So two Matauna was placed on the earth in opposition and conflict every day of our lives and it's been consecrated for our good, not for our demise and our destruction. It's so that we'll be able to see through, through things and situations will arise, but we'll see through the smoke and the mirrors. But we can only see through that if the Spirit is there with us. And that's why I showed you those designs today when you talked about the conflict that's eating away in yes, your head. Yes. Those, those are two distinct carvings that we have. Two bird beaks on either side of your head. And you'll see that there was a hand reaching through on the lower jaw. Because the lower jaw to our people means these are the ways and the philosophies of men. They change from day to day. Policies are brought in. Legislation. Everyone justifies it. You get lawyers, three, four lawyers, all got a different spin, different mm -hmm. spiel. Mm -hmm. eh? Because that's lower contextual. That's to do with man's ways. But the upper jawbone we call the kowairunga, it never moves because that's our connection to spirit, to mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And his laws don't change. So I needed to, needed to share that with you because conflict has been consecrated for our benefit. And Evelyn, what, what, what do you think? How, how, does you, how do you sit with all of this? What's your... I uh, am thinking that uh, whoever watches us now has received a rich lecture, <laughs> a dialogical lecture. We thought in the beginning we wanted to make an introductory video, but now it is this is already a, a kind of lecture or presentation or sharing, a, a much larger. We have spent how much time now? It's not just 15 minutes, much more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in a way we have already gone into the topic. We, um, and, and whoever has followed this now uh, would like to know, okay, what can I do with that? Um, can I uh, have a seminar with you, uh, you know, online, a workshop, a course, what, what next? Mm -hmm. The person will now ask, what next? The person, you know, we invite you, everybody who watches this now, to click on uh, this video and to write comments and, and um, I envisage that um, you could, for example, just as an example, if 20 students now from all over the world, 20 people, you know, lawyers, doctors, students, whoever it could be who wants to learn more from you, um, let us say 20 people from all around the world, mm -hmm. what could be the next step? The next step could be, for example, that they all come here to you, that you invite them, yeah, that you make an, uh, uh, a conference, a meeting for those who can afford to come and that you uh, allow everybody who cannot afford to come to be with you via video connection. And then everybody goes home and follows a course, a seminar, a workshop with you via video online throughout the rest of the year. And then, then you make a final meeting. This would be one way, just to give an example. So uh, in, in five years, let us say, uh, we hope that our World Dignity University initiative has many, many people who offer their knowledge to the world. And that we find many ways of how we can manifest that and not just include people who want to learn from you who are here physically, but how we can include the world globally. People who want to learn from you globally. So we, we, we would like that you create this, you know, together with the people who are interested in learning from you, that you co-create this and inspire other people in our movement to co-create theirs. And that we come uh, after uh, a while also that we can have a PhD in, in different fields, for example, in, in what you are teaching. So perhaps uh, you could what would what would be would there be one uh, heading for what you yes. want to offer? I, I would say that the one way that we have brought this, um, what may sound a bit esoteric or even um, cultural.
perspective or language or understanding or way, what, one way we've, we've brought it down to something that's very practical is by calling it holistic communication and by drawing on um, academic uh, uh, understood um, research, especially the research that's, that's more neurocardial um, research of, of um, the last 15 years, there has been um, ways then of bringing together the, the wisdom of the, of the indigenous people and wisdom of traditional knowledge and bringing that together so, it's, so that that can sit next to, not on top of, not underneath, but actually with and creates the, the, the necessary understanding to complete what um, modern science has, has um, developed and, and brought some cognitive or thinking or, or language to. And so we are calling this holistic communication. Holistic, not just to include all aspects, but to include, include the sacred as well, that that is, is a necessary aspect. And how to do this in a practical way. So you don't have to um, become a, uh, initiated into a Maori tribe, or you don't have to um, become... No, you do. <laughs> you, need to, you need to be initiated into to the group of people that operate from the spirit. That's true. That is very true. That is very true. And that's, that is what our offering is. And yeah. we, we have brought it down. We've managed to get conferences in um, for judiciary, judiciary, for peace, now for, for this group, which is the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies. We've written a book, we have many articles that have been published. So it's not something that is um, airy-fairy, so to speak, yeah. or people, should I say just airy-fairy. People have wanted evidence, evidence-based, yeah. but we are the evidence. You are the evidence. We're still here. Uh, yes. we, we've suffered um, yes. quite a lot, but we've, we, we have more things to celebrate because we've resolved the conflict. Um, just this morning, for the first time in our, oh, second time in our history, the Governor General, second time as a Māori, the General. Yeah. So, no. mm -hmm. um, so what we were talking about was uh, through, through forgiveness and the example set and left by our leaders mm -hmm. around um, non-violent uh, reaction to all the oppression that's happened, and the power of forgiveness is that um, that's in the 18, 1860s and now in this period of time we are really a blessed people. Um, a lot of our people are still stuck in conflict but um, our leaders have actually paved the path for us so now the general of our armies in New Zealand is Māori. The Governor General, the second Governor General of our country for the second time is a Māori. Um, we, we have more members in every political party than ever before and we have two Māori parties, the Mana Party and the Māori Party in government. Those are majors for our people. We have kohanga reos which take children straight from the womb where they're um, immersed totally into our culture, our principles and values which Aroha and forgiveness are right at the forefront of those teachings. Mana, giving mana and dignity to women. You see, acknowledging their sacred gift of, of procreation is taught to them from an early age. Right through to, we have five Māori universities now, so our children can be immersed in these principles and values alongside tertiary education, which we still put way to the side because mm -hmm. our principles and values will take them to a higher level anyway. And then, so we have five Māori universities, so we can come literally from the womb to the tomb, immersed in our, in our principles and values. So that's been the outcome of, uh, of the passive resistance movement. And you promised to talk about traditional leadership. Mm -hmm. yes. And our interest is, you know, democracy as we have it now. How can we go beyond? Yes, well... In, in, our, in our culture, of course, it comes under um, leadership that holds fast to those principles 
of truth and integrity, eh? mm -hmm. Tika and love. Mm -hmm. So, so that was at the highest of our hierarchy. We call that a Taio Puri. The Taio Puri is the high chief, and and what he holds is he holds. They call they say that he has control of the incoming and outgoing tide. Mm. That's to do with providing for people. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. But it literally means that he has responsibility for the incoming generation mm -hmm. and those that are passing on. Mm -hmm. Both coming from the same place, mm -hmm. from the spiritual realm, and then the elders are returning back to the spiritual realm to maintain that. They arrived pure and they returned pure. That's his role. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is when they have meetings and they come together, there's a hierarchy that is seven deep mm -hmm. from the highest down. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is if there's a conflict there. So in um, democracy, the, um, the majority will vote on something and the minority you know, and this is what focuses what happens to indigenous people, where the minority uh, to predominant cultures. And so what happens is uh, we get left out. Mm -hmm. But in our old ancient society, the minority, if, if people disagreed with something, what would happen was those that sat below the high chief, they would all go back to the Ahu Piri Council which was a council of those of, of our sages, of our leaders. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is they would deliberate and they would, see, because they'd put all their minds together based on those principles mm -hmm. of being true, being faithful to their beliefs and having mercy. Mm -hmm. Then they would strive to bring that group back in. So the minority held all of the power. And so a lot of times, many times, they would pray for inspiration. And then through inspiration, they would actually pray that that, that smaller group would soften towards what they were saying. And it used mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. So that they'd use different ways to bring them in, but all based on those principles mm -hmm. until they all came back into the collective. Mm -hmm. And then that's what they did. Mm -hmm. Now that's total, we call kotahitanga. That's unity. See, because that's the only way to truly take people forward. Yes. Okay? And yes. I think we have to soon round up. Yes. Perhaps a last question. How would you define or explain, perhaps it's too much now, no, no. humiliation, dignity, uh, respect, unity, diversity. Um, if it's too sad, you know, it's too, too big a question. No, 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 no. <laughs> you spoke no, no, no. about that before. No, no, I, I, can, I can sum it up in the words of the son of Pototau Te Whero Whero, who is the Māori king at the end of the 1700s. And um, he is, comes from the direct lineage of King Kamehameha I. If you count back in the lines of genealogy, you'll come to the same ancestors who we believe were prophets. And I'd use the statement um, that he said to his son, and he said to his son, Kia whai manu anu, yāpe. And his, his, his counsel to his son was to always have a big heart, mm. a generous heart. Now, his son left a proclamation to our people because before Te Whiti and Tohu's lands were burned and confiscated and they were imprisoned down here in Dunedin, the imperial troops had come through the king country. So you've got to remember now, 12,000 troops were brought in from all over the world to exterminate less than 2,000 of the king's people. They went through there. Our people still survived that. Yes. And you know what he said after that? He came down to Te Whiti and his ancestor and they had peace talks. Not war talks. They had peace talks to deal with it. And they all came to the same consensus that they needed to forgive. So what I leave in closing around dignity and humiliation is that he said this statement, Ko tanya, ko te te nira, 
e kuhuna ai te miro ma te miro pango te miro fero and he said that all nations because he talked about three threads black red and and white all peoples would have to come through the same portal of understanding mm -hmm. and that was that they all needed to kiafai manua nui that they all needed to have big hearts to be compassionate and then he said kotahi ano te wai e horo oi ai he said again they all need to be cleansed by the one water and he spoke of the cleansing water of tane nui arangi which was the god of peace that they would all have to be cleansed by that same water you see and then he said kia mau ki te ture o te whenua live the law of the land he wasn't saying live the law of your oppressors he said live the law that our ancestors knew that was to keep balance with mm -hmm. ecology mm -hmm. and with mankind mm -hmm. that's what he said kia, he said this as well kia mangu ki waho we appear to the, of these foreigners that we are black on the outside. But he said, Kia ma ki oto, always re remain pure on the inside. Mm -hmm. So all the proverbs of the chiefs that came to those meetings said, I kite ano te kokono te whare, ka hore i kite te kokono te ngako, which means you can see the corner of a house or a building, but you can't see the corner of the heart. Mm -hmm. Kia ora tata. Wow, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you.